All right. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this, our last on, huh, virtual nature program series of November. Um, it's been a action-packed month, I feel like, with I believe we are pretty close to a program a week. And I know a lot of you joined us for many of those. So thank you. Um, before I turn things over to tonight's presenters, I wanted to first thank our nature program series sponsors, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment. Um, if you frequent those establishments, please do thank them for their continued financial support. And if you would like to support us, we would love that. The best way to do that is to become a member of Tin Mountain. You can do that right on our website in the upper right-hand corner where it says- It does show you as a- even you, can also, um, you can also just support our nature program series, donating five or $10 um, in that same link, support us. There's a button just to donate to our nature program series to help these programs continue. Um, and we do have a couple of really interesting programs coming up. Um, we have, I think many of you saw today, um, while we can't do our, you know, our annual winter greens and wreath making in-person program, we are in the process of uh, translating it to a DIY wreath making kit. Um, and we have a limited number of those. Um, we're already, I think, more than halfway sold out of our wreath making kits, um, but you can reserve yours. They'll be available for pickup starting December 1st, but you can reserve yours by calling Tin Mountain or on our website. There's actually a link to reserve one online, um, so you can do that. And then after uh, the Thanksgiving, next week being Thanksgiving, after that, um, we have uh, on December 3rd, we have... Um, a board member from the International Dark Skies Association talking about the ecological impact of brightening night skies. Um, and then the following week on Friday, a departure from our normal Thursday evening programs, we have on Friday, December 11th, we have Annie Ropeek, uh, NHPR's environmental reporter presenting on some of her uh, climate change work. So some really great programs coming up, but also a really great and really exciting program tonight. Um, we have had uh, Jill Kilborn, um, a biologist from New Hampshire Fishing Game. We have had her before to talk about uh, some of the state's Martin, Pine Martin research, um, but we're very excited to have her back. We actually had reached out to her um, a while, I want to say now it was probably over a year ago to talk about the state of the New Hampshire lynx population. And um, at that point, they were still waiting for their current, for the, their project to finish and to be able to really summarize those results. And so we are very excited to, uh, to be able to offer this program um, tonight. So I am going to turn things over to Jill. Um, we have, I know a lot of you have been with programs before. It looks like we have a number of new people too, which is so exciting. Um, what I will say is that you were all um, muted upon entry. Um, what I would say is that if you have questions or clar clarifying questions or content questions for Jill, um, if you want to type them directly into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. I will be monitoring that. Um, if it's not an immediate clarifying question, I will hold those and ask them of Jill at the end of the program, um, at which time you can also unmute yourself and, and ask questions of her directly. Um, otherwise, thank you for joining us and I'm gonna hand things over to Jill. Excellent, thank you, Nora. Um, let's make sure I get the right screen here. All right, can everybody see that showing up? Excellent. Uh, so as Nora said, my name is Jill Kilborn. I'm a wildlife biologist with New Hampshire Fishing Game. Um, I don't know if I want to admit this or not, but this is my first time actually presenting to the public uh, virtually. So it's a little bit of a weird experience for me. I'm used to seeing the reaction of my audience and seeing everybody out there. So 
Um, I hope it goes well and everybody enjoys. Um, so as a wildlife biologist for the department, I have a wide variety of responsibilities, uh, but my primary duties is land management. We own a 25,000 acre piece of property that's in the northern, very northern tip of the state. So I spend a good chunk of my time up on that property, just making sure that the wildlife on the property uh, that are supposed to be there are there and that we're doing habitat management and kind of making conditions good for the for the wildlife up there. So I'm also very fortunate to be able to work with um, some species specifically. Uh, since I first started working for the department about 20 years ago, um, I started working with American Martin and that was the work that I presented a couple years ago uh, that Nora, Nora referred to. Um, and then after the Martin work, uh, I kind of got into that. I actually got into some lynx work and I'll talk about kind of the timeline and how that all came to be. So the presentation tonight um, will dive into a little bit of the biology and the background of lynx and then I'll talk specifically about the work that we've been doing over the past six years on the species to try and understand them better here in New Hampshire. So I just wanna give a quick shout out to um, our funding sources. This project was uh, partially funded through our non-game and endangered species program. So because lynx are a listed species in New Hampshire, it's very restrictive as to where we can get the funding for the species. So to those of you that have conservation and heritage license plate, um, plates on your vehicles. So the moose plate, know that some of that funding came directly into this project and helped to fund the work that we did here. Uh, we also received um, some grants from the Knopp Family Foundation for purchasing cameras. There was multiple donations that came into the non-game program specifically for this work. Um, and then we received some uh, federal money for specifically because they're a federally listed species. And then a huge chunk of the funding also came from the Northeast Climate Science Adaptation Center, which was the group out of UMass Amherst that Alexei Sarin, who is the PhD candidate that worked on this project, uh, was directly funded through that program down out of UMass. So a uh, huge shout out to those folks for all the funding and assistance that they provided for this work. So a little bit about lynx um, and their background. Lynx are a, a boreal species found throughout North America. Historically, they were found down through the Adirondacks um, and into central New Hampshire in the White Mountain National Forest. And as you can see, they were also found historically down the Rocky Mountain chain. Um, more recently, they've kind of retracted in their distribution. Um, mostly in the, in the West, is, that retraction is most obvious and it's pulled way back up into Canada. And here in the Northeast, back when they were first listed in 2000, um, it was really thought that lynx weren't in the Northeast at all. But as you'll see when I talk about their distribution now, we're actually finding them uh, in more places than we thought we had them. So a little bit of history about lynx in New Hampshire. Um, the height of the abundance that we can find from the records that we do have was probably back in the 1930s. Um, and this was as the state was essentially reforesting refor after being cleared from um, extensive agriculture and grazing that took place in the state. Um, one of the last strongholds was actually in the White Mountain National Forest. Um, and it was in an area that was burned pretty heavily when they were still using uh, trains fired by coal um, that actually lit a bunch of fires in the White Mountain National Forest. And as a result, the, the forest that came back seemed to provide some really excellent habitat for, for lynx and snowshoe hare. So they essentially just kind of disappeared after the 1970s. And this was probably highly related to the, the habitat kind of growing out of being good habitat for snowshoe hare. And then in 2010, we started to see a re resurgence of lynx in the state, um, but it wasn't in the White Mountain National Forest where we had them originally or as the last stronghold. And it seemed to be just in the very Northern tip of the state that we were finding them. So the picture here, I actually love this picture is uh, 
a local trapper, uh, his mother actually holding a lynx, one of the last lynx that was actually trapped in the state back in 1934. Currently, lynx are listed as a federally threatened species uh, and that listing happened back in 2000 um, and they are listed as a New Hampshire state endangered. So our state listing status can be uh, a higher rank depending on what the status of that animal is than the federal rank, rank. But if it is federally listed, it automatically goes on our state list of uh, threatened or, or endangered species. So just to kind of clarify, because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion over what exactly is the difference between bobcats and lynx. Um, one of the first things I hear when somebody contacts me and says that they saw a lynx was it had to be a lynx. It had a really big body. Um, lynx and bobcats in the northeast, specifically at the northern edge of the bobcats range, actually overlap in their size quite a bit. So a large male uh, lynx is a very similar in size to a large male bobcat. Um, so that is not a great indicator of whether or not you saw a bobcat or a lynx. Uh, the tail is one of the first things that is the great indicator. Um, if you look at this picture over here on the left of the, the lynx tail, that black tip of the tail goes all the way around the tip of the tail. Whereas with a bobcat, you'll have a white um, that goes out to the tip of the tail and the black is only on the very top of the tail. So that's one of the first things to look for. The ear tufts are also very obvious, much longer on a lynx. Um, and that black ear tuft can be difficult to see unless you're very close to the animal, but on a bobcat, they're much shorter. The face also has a larger ruff on the lynx, so it kind of sticks out and flares out from the lynx's face, whereas bobcats have a more compact kind of look to their face. But really the telltale, the telltale way to tell the difference between a lynx and a bobcat is all about these feet. Uh, lynx have extraordinarily large feet for their body size so that they can cruise around on top of snow and bobcats have these small kind of dainty feet that definitely pop into the snow um, and makes it really difficult for them to get around. Um, and just to point out on this photo, the, the other thing when you're looking at photos, overall coloration to the body, lynx tend to be very uniform in color. Um, you don't see a lot of differentiation between the belly and the, and the back, and they seem to be kind of gray all over. Bobcats often have a white underbelly, and they always have this telltale kind of dark black or darker bottom to their foot here. And that often sticks out very prominently when you get photos of them out in the field. So moving on to tracks, because um, this is often what we end up seeing in the field instead of the animal itself is the tracks that they leave behind. So um, lynx, I often refer to a, as the, the ice cream cone track because they have this kind of telltale large puffy section at the very top by the where the toes are that leads down to this skinny section where the back of the foot as it lands in the snow and they're spreading their toes to get along on top of the snow. So it kind of makes this uh, ice cream cone appearance to the track. As you can see in the photo, they really do spread those toes and it allows them to kind of spread out that service area and really get on top of the snow. Whereas the bobcats, as you can see here, sink right down in um, and it's a much smaller track. And I always like to pull up this slide um, to show that lynx really are built like a snowshoe hare in those hind feet. They have those really long tarsals that give those feet that ability to kind of like stretch out on top of that snow and it always amazes me at how similar those two photos look when you look at the, the structure of the, the bones in those feet. So hare habitat is lynx habitat. So lynx are very dependent on snowshoe hare and snowshoe hare like young regenerating softwood forests. So spruce and fir is the big thing for having uh, links on your landscape. Through all the research that's been done in the Northeast, we also have found that it's really important to have more than 270 centimeters of snow per year. Um, it has been something that they identified and that's about 8.8 .8 feet of snow. So if you think about how much snow that is, that's 
above my head and I'm six feet tall. So uh, it's a lot of snow. Uh, so as I was saying, links are very dependent on snowshoe hair. They're almost an obligate to snowshoe hair. Um, it makes up 35 to 100% of their diet. And it's um, most common that it's a 90 to 100% of their diet. If the snowshoe hair population declines significantly, they will do some prey switching. They find that uh, a lot of the times it ends up being some smaller mammals such as red squirrels. And you can imagine how many red squirrels it would take to, to make a good living. So snowshoe hare really are critical for, for lynx on a landscape. And they have a functional feeding response to hair densities, which just means as hair densities increase, lynx will increase the number of um, kittens that they have in their litters. And as the hair densities decrease, we often find that lynx will actually disperse from areas and actually um, create lower densities in bigger home ranges. So it's just a very functional response that tracks hair very specifically. And so it works out to uh, lynx eating about 170 to 200 hairs per year. So when you think about all the other critters out there in the forest that like to eat snowshoe hair, it makes me kind of feel bad for these guys because everybody likes to eat them. So as I was saying, uh, when snowshoe hare populations decline, you get increased dispersal and movement of the lynx. Um, a female home range is somewhere around 11 square miles, where a male is about 30, so more than double what the female home range is. And lynx, for the most part, are solitary. You will see females um, with kittens, but for the most part, the females and the males don't uh, travel together unless it's during the breeding season. Lynx breed usually in March and April and they have one to five kittens. Again, that functional response when there's lots of snowshoe hair, they can have up to five kittens in a litter. Um, the gestation is about 60 to 65 days. So they're having those kittens uh, early in the summer in May through July. Um, almost two years to, redult, to reach an adult size and the kitten will actually stay with the female until the next breeding season and they do breed every year. So this is just a little bit of a timeline to show you how things have happened here in New Hampshire that kind of led up to the research that we're doing. Back in 2000, as I said, lynx were placed uh, on the federal list of threatened species in the lower 48. And at this time, we really didn't have a good understanding of where lynx were, especially in the Northeast. Um, it was a real um, surprise in Maine when they first started researching how many lynx they actually ended up finding. Um, and they've done extensive research on that population um, since 2000 uh, with multiple studies that actually collared animals and really established what was going on with the population here in the Northeast. Then back in 2006, there was a study that was done along Route 2 up here in Coas County um, to figure out, they were looking at it for expanding and wider, widening Route 2. So they did a bunch of track transects along the side of the road to see what kind of animals were crossing and where they were crossing. And it was actually one of the first tracks that was confirmed um, that was heading kind of, for those of you that are familiar, um, it's Bowman Corner, so it's near the Jefferson Valley or Jefferson Notch Road, north up through Kilkenny, um, or the Kilkenny portion of the White Mountain National Forest. So this was the first kind of sign of new activity that was going on in Coas County. Then in 2010, we actually had somebody that had some remote cameras out in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, and they actually uh, caught kittens on the camera and then we actually had a hunter that was up there as well and actually got a video of the kittens uh, out on one of the logging roads in Pittsburgh. So it was really exciting for us because it was the first time that we actually knew of animals in New Hampshire that were what we called breeding because of the kittens. Now I will say that those kittens were within a five mile distance of Maine, <laughs> but they were still captured in New Hampshire. So we considered the first breeding evidence that we had in a very long time. Um, in 2012, we started some track transects in low elevation sites to kind of try and get a better handle at how much uh, activity we were having in New Hampshire. And we expanded those transects into the high elevation in 2013. 
We then started coupling the track transects with cameras, um, specifically concentrating in the high elevation habitats because it was very difficult to get the track transects done in high elevation. So for doing the transects, you have to cover a certain amount of distance um, to say whether, whether or not an animal is in the area. And it's very difficult to get that distance in in the high elevation habitat. So cameras were a great option to kind of fill that gap. Um, we put out the new wildlife action plan in 2015. And at this point, we decided to transition to more cameras as part of the study. Um, in 2017, we received a, a good chunk of money to expand that effort. And uh, then the, the study actually wrapped up in uh, this spring with the PhD candidate kind of summarizing everything for us. So the original study uh, set out to try and understand why lynx were not consistently found in the White Mountain National Forest because it was such a stronghold right up to the end for lynx. And then we needed to identify distribution um, and figure out how we were going to monitor lynx distribution in New Hampshire over time. So as I said, uh, we started with track transects, which essentially was getting on a snow machine in the wintertime and driving um, a certain number of miles after a snowstorm and very slowly creeping along and documenting all the tracks that we saw as we crept along all of those snow machine trails. So we were doing everything from lynx and bobcat to fisher and coyote and snowshoe hare to kind of get a, as good of a picture as we could for the different species and where they were um, and the conditions that were associated with each of those species. Um, and again, this is where the high elevation monitoring came into play because as I said, we couldn't get access up into those areas on snow machine. So we were resorting to a lot of really awesome volunteers um, and folks that were willing to get out there and hike those trails and log those miles to see if we could find links up in the White Mountain National Forest. So this all morphed and we quickly realized it was way more than uh, I as a biologist that had a bunch of other responsibilities um, could take on. And Alexei was looking to move on from his master's work to, to his PhD work. Um, and we were able to get him in at UMass Amherst with the Northeast Climate Science Adaptation Center to take on this project and really give it the effort and the focus that it needed to figure out what was going on. So uh, this slide kind of establishes the, the theory or um, the base kind of work behind Alexei's PhD. Um, Charles Darwin, a long time ago, established that wildlife populations, um, those that are on their southern edge, so a species like lynx or moose or snowshoe hare, are often limited by prey or habitat or competition. Um, and then those species that are on their northern edge, so like deer and bobcat and cottontails, are often limited by something that's not living. So it's either snow or temperature. So when you think of a, a white-tailed deer, they, they concentrate into deer yards in the wintertime because they can't deal with deep snow conditions very well. So they're on that northern edge of their range. And when they, we get really deep snow, deep snow winters with really cold temperatures, it can really kill a lot of our deer up in the northern part of the range. So just showing these two relationships. Now knowing this, um, we know that this relationship is much more complex than this, but nobody's really been able to use different modeling efforts to kind of show how each of the things come into play. So the lynx example, Alexei explored not only lynx, but a variety of other species in his PhD, but he focused on this, this example with lynx. So lynx are at the southern edge of their distribution. Therefore, theoretically, they're, they're limited by prey, snowshoe hare, which we've established, and then habitat, which is the, the spruce fir, and competition. But what he set out to understand was, was the snow limiting the competitors or was the competitors li limiting the, the lynx directly? So he really wanted to tease apart those relationships so that we could better understand that, okay, if our bobcat population is doing really well and seems to be expanding up into lynx distribution, 
Is that bad for lynx? And should we be thinking about that? Or is it snow, which is very much driven by the climate and climate change? So how much should we be worrying about snow when it comes to lynx conservation? So all these pieces he was trying to tease out through his work. So this is all done through what's called occupancy. Um, and it's very common now with all the camera data that's, that's being produced in the wildlife field. And like I said, he just was really trying to understand the relationship between bobcat and lynx and whether or not that relationship was direct through snow or if it was directly with the lynx itself. So how did we get here? How did we decide to tackle this question? So Link, uh, Alex A was really great and uh, coordinating between both New Hampshire and Vermont and was able to actually establish 257 different camera locations um, where he was monitoring species distribution uh, across the, that area over a six year period. So he had these cameras out year round uh, would check them three to four times a year um, for six years worth of data. And as you can imagine, it created a huge pile of data, hundreds and thousands of photos that he and a, a large uh, charge of graduate students and uh, interns had to sift through and tag um, from all those photos that were collected over that period. So all of those photos were categorized by species. And then he was also tagging each of the photos because he was measuring snow depth at each of the, the camera stations as well. So he was taking climate data as well as wildlife data at each of these points. So some of the results just from the, the data and those cameras and the track transects. The track transects resulted in 38 different track locations for lynx alone. Um, and this map down here shows uh, some of those track transects and where the, the lynx, so again, very much in the very northern tip of the state. And then you can see these bobcat tracks that we found at the same time during those track transects. The camera data as it expanded over that six year period ended up producing 130 different links camera detections. Uh, many of those observations were at the same camera at multiple different cameras. So the top map here simply shows the bigger the dot, the more detections of links that we got at that camera. So all the orange dots represent the places where links were actually detected. So the next step was then to try and uh, identify the factors that were impacting lynx distribution. So uh, a lot of this work is done through GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems, which is simply a program that's used to geo-reference or to put uh, a location on a map. It's a mapping software that's used to analyze data so that we can pull all of this together, stack it all on top of one another, and then figure out um, different questions using, using that information. So we knew that snow was very critical uh, for lynx, but Alex A actually found it was snow duration. So the longer our winters were, the better that was for lynx. So this is the layer that he ended up using uh, to model lynx with the, the camera data with snow duration. The other factor that we I've talked about and we know is very important for lynx is uh, young softwood forest. So there's no good way to represent young softwood forest at large landscapes, especially across two states. Um, but we were very fortunate to find this layer called biomass, which came out of one of the UMass landscape ecology labs. And it essentially maps um, the amount of woody biomass on the landscape at a certain point in time. <clears throat> so we were able to directly correlate that biomass um, to the forest type on the ground using forest mapping. Um, so the two were crosswalks. So we were actually able to map where our young softwood forest was. So these areas in yellow actually represent areas of high softwood uh, young forest. 
It's a low biomass, but lots of young softwood forest. And then using all the camera data, he was actually able to map a bunch of other species. So one was prey. He had a pile of snowshoe hair photos. So he was actually able to produce a layer showing um, how abundant or how common snowshoe hair was across his study area based on the camera data. He was also able to do the same for two of the biggest competitors of lynx, which are bobcats, bobcat and coyote. So again, he was able to produce layers showing how abundant these two species were across and where they overlapped with where the lynx occurrences were. So this uh, figure scared me the first time I saw it. <laughs> and I just wanted to throw it up there to show you guys um, how complex all these relationships are. And we've never been able to tease all of these relationships out before until Alex A uh, was able to pull all of this data together to show all these different interactions and how important they were in each, each individual piece. And this is all very new statistics that are just coming out as a result of all of the camera work that is now being done because camera data collection is something that's exploded over the last 20 years. So it really is the, the leading edge of uh, uh, distribution and occupancy modeling that's, that's being done here with this data. So this was the final map that got cranked out from all of that data. The map here on the bottom actually represents what the old uh, modeling would have looked like before we could have done the interaction piece. So as you can see, um, there's areas that actually popped up as being important for links that we knew were not important for links. And as soon as we incorporated Bobcat and where Bobcat distribution would be, and um, teased out some of those relationships that Alex A was able to do through the modeling work he was doing, it quickly identified the very northern tip of the state as the primary area. But as you'll see, we still have the White Mountain National Forest, which is in the central portion, as being identified as a really important place for lynx in New Hampshire. So I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into that because we're still a little perplexed by this and uh, figuring out how we can tease the, the detail out of this. So just a, a summary again for the lynx work. Um, snow is a very strong in indicator for lynx um, and it's through its effect on bobcats. So snow limits bobcats and therefore bobcats are excluded from areas and lynx are able to kind of thrive and move into those areas. Habitat management plays a very important role for lynx because they're so dependent on that young regenerating spruce fir forest. Um, and the species distribution models that include those direct effects, so direct effect of snow and indirect effect of competition with bobcat are much better at predicting where a species, are gonna, where a species is gonna be. So a few of the other really cool things that came out of the camera work um, was all the other species data that came along with it. So these are just plots showing all the other species that Alex A actually worked with in his PhD. Links are here in the middle, but one of the other really interesting um, species that obviously I have interest in is the Martin data that came out of it. And Al Alex A is actually working with our moose project leader now to look at the moose population and the camera data to kind of tease out some information for moose as well. And then the other piece that we kind of knew, but uh, was just reaffirmed by all the camera data was that the competing species such as coyote, bobcats and fisher are all limited at those high elevation habitats and deep snow conditions. So we found as soon as snow came on, these species disappeared from the high elevation. And then as soon as the snow disappeared in the spring, these species moved back up into the mountains and started utilizing those habitats again. So it's this partitioning that happens seasonally um, between the species that are built for deep snow conditions and those that are not. So it was just a really interesting thing um, that we noted out of the research.
So this brought us, brings me back to my original questions that I posed to you. Um, we were interested in figuring out links distribution, but we also were trying to figure out why links were not found in the White Mountain National Forest. So the links were historically there. Um, they have recolonized New England, but not have not recolonized the White Mountain National Forest. Um, and we know that we have lots of snowshoe hare in the White Mountain National Forest, and so that the, the link should be there. Um, and the snowshoe hare populations um, should be uh, um, stable in those areas because uh, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of uh, what are called fur waves. So it's a phenomenon that happens in Japan, in the Northeast, in Newfoundland, in the mountain, mountains found around us. And it's prevailing winds that actually cause this wave effect across our mountains where uh, the wind will uh, uh, knock over or cause stress on trees, which eventually breaks down and gets into the root system and will cause these um, bands of fir, spruce and fir to die across the mountain. And as you can see here in this photo, it actually creates this wave effect where you have bands of dead trees followed by bands of live trees by dead trees. And this continuously moves across that mountainside over time. And it's something that we refer to as a, a natural succession of that stand. And it's constantly producing young spruce and fir over time. So that, that mountain always has a certain percentage of it that's in that younger spruce and fir age class. So our question really was, in these places where this natural dynamic is happening, is there enough of it to provide snowshoe hare habitat? And if the snowshoe hare are there, are they there in high enough densities to support lynx? So this was the second half of Alex A's PhD work was where he actually went out to um, a high elevation stand in the White Mountain National Forest, and then a place in the Nulhegan Basin of Vermont, which is a lowland spruce fir site, and then another lowland kind of spruce fir site in the very northern tip of New Hampshire in Pittsburgh. Um, and in e each of these locations, he set up pellet plots which are simply um, blocks that have wooden dowels set at certain di distances apart. Let me see if I have the, I thought I had a diagram of it. Um, and at each of those plots, he counts the number of snowshoe hair pellets or poop. And that um, count is directly correlated to the number of snowshoe hair that are found in that area. So from this data, he was able to look at distribution. Um, he also went out and live trapped two of the stands, the, the high elevation stand in the White Mountain National Forest, as well as the stand in the Nulhegan Basin, um, and put collars on the snowshoe hare so that he was able to fo follow them around and determine um, survival and how they used the area, et cetera. So just as we expected, um, biomass, again, that layer that I showed you about early regenerating forests showed that uh, young forest was really important for snowshoe hare. The more you had, the higher the density or the higher the occurrence. Um, snow or duration of snow was also very important. So the more days of snow cover you had, again, the higher the snowshoe hare density. And then here's my, my pellet uh, plot. So and then the density was shown according to these, these pellet plots. So the number of snowshoe hare pellets that we counted directly correlated um, to the density of snowshoe hare. So these graphs just show that this is the relationship that was established in Maine, where they also did this work. Um, so a count of 5,000 pellets meant that you had a density of approximately 0.7 snowshoe hare per hectare on that landscape. So a great way to figure out whether or not the landscape had enough snowshoe hair to support lynx. In the telemetry portion of the study, he had snowshoe hair in the low elevation sites with very small movements. And then in the high elevation here on the right, 
He had very patchy habitat associated with those fur waves and those snowshoe hare made much bigger movements. They were bouncing between those patches instead of staying in a very tight area in the lowland sites. So what he found for densities in the Nulhegan Basin, so the low elevation spruce fir site, that he actually had 0.52 hairs per hectare. Um, and we have known, we know from the work that was done in Maine that that 0.5 hair per hectare is the critical threshold for lynx on a landscape. You fall below 0.5 hairs and lynx fall off your, your landscape. They're no longer found there. When you have more than 0.5 hairs per hectare, that's enough to support lynx on your landscape. So he actually found that in the White Mountain National Forest, the highest densities was around 0.09 hairs per hectare. So nowhere near the density that needed to be there to support lynx over time. Uh, he also found higher survival in the lower density, high elevation populations. So as I was telling you, with all those competitors that moved down out of that habitat in the wintertime, resulted in those hares not being predated on. So they had a much higher survival over time. And one of the other really interesting things that came out of it is he actually found that parasitism was very common on the hares at the lower elevation sites. And as soon as you started getting up into the higher elevation sites, those parasites or the ticks dropped off and those hares had very few parasites on them. Um, so not, they did not have the stress of having to support the parasites in the high elevation sites either. So this just kind of summarizes what I just said, but that young forest is very important. Hair density was lower at the high elevation and it was too low for lynx. So that is why we didn't have lynx in the White Mountain National Forest consistently. Hares had larger movements in the high elevation due to that patchy distribution of habitat. They appeared more stable in the high elevation. Um, survival was higher at high elevation. And the parasitism was prevalent uh, at the low elevation site. So the next steps for this part of the study uh, is we want to actually dive a little bit deeper into that habitat to try and figure out if the fur wave ever does get to the point where snowshoe hair would be abundant enough for lynx. So we want to go back to those sites, sample those hair densities, sample a bunch of the vegetation, and then they want to fly it with drones to actually really see if we can pick up what is the best condition for snowshoe hair, and if we can model that over time. And then the camera work has actually been identified as the best way to monitor lynx over time. Um, the federal uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to delist lynx, hopefully in the next year or so, based on the data that has been collected. And they've decided that camera work most likely, likely is gonna be the, the best way to monitor that population over time to make sure that that is the right decision. So with that, that kind of wraps up all the, the research and the information that I had and I'll open it up to questions if anybody has them. All right, Jill, thank you so much for that. That was a fabulous presentation with lots of, of great information. I am going to just start off the questions with um, two that came into um, the group chat while the program was going on. Um, and the first was, this was right at the beginning, more of, um, you know, of a logical, um, what is the purpose of the ear tufts on, um, on the legs? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, so cats are typically ambush predators. They're not like stalkers. Um, so it's not, it may have something to do with how they're hearing and picking up on sounds, I guess, possibly, but I'm not sure specifically. Okay, and then this one, I will warn you, it's from our uh, research director. So of course he's gonna dive right into, <laughs> right into the weeds and, um, Sorry about that. Uh, his question is, did Alexi factor in the rate of snowpack loss over the past several decades into his model of occupancy going forward? 
No, the recent Hubbard Brook study on climate noted a loss of 21 days of snowpack over the past 100 years. Yeah, so that was the, the piece. I didn't get too much into it, but he did do some modeling looking at um, the changes that we've had over time, but specifically what from this point forward might do. Um, and so there's a bunch of models out there showing potentially how our snow duration is gonna change over time. Um, and so uh, on one of those figures that I brought up, there was a 2080 photo or model that showed potentially what Lynx occupancy is gonna do uh, all the way out to 2080. Um, and surprisingly, we, we kept a good chunk of our habitat and that was mostly driven by that forest biomass because we're predicted to have more young forest moving into the future. I'm not really sure why, and I'm not really sure I believe it, <laughs> um, but that's what the models are saying is that biomass piece is really more important than the amount of snow that we're gonna lose over time for lynx. Interesting. Um, and one more that came in here before I, I will open it up to quest for people to unmute themselves. Um, and that is, um, did you find any predation on lynx from male fisher? Uh, we did not. Um, we didn't have any animals collared though, so it wouldn't have been something that we would have picked up in this study. But in the work that they did in Maine, uh, they documented very well that fisher were actually one of the primary predators of lynx kittens. So not that a fisher would take down an adult lynx, but definitely with kittens in the den, they actually had a couple situations where fisher predated on those kittens. So definitely one of those direct predate, predation situations. Okay, great. Um, that is, so those are the end of the questions that came in. So if folks have questions for Jill, if you want to um, just manually unmute yourself and, and ask her directly. Uh, how long, how long do they live, the lynx? Oh, that's a great, great question. Um, I don't know specifically. I know some of the lynx that they had collared in Maine. Um, they believe some of those lynx, uh, I think were easily more than 10 years old. Um, but I don't, I don't know exactly how long they live. What do you think of the um, delisting, proposed delisting by the federal agency? Yeah. Good or bad and why? Yep, I, I actually think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, I've been participating in the discussions that we've had about how to monitor the species uh, if the delisting does happen. Um, and really the original reason behind the listing back in 2000 was because there was a lack of um, uh, regulatory mechanisms, mostly out west, to ensure that there was lynx habitat um, and that they were managing for lynx out west because it was primarily public land. Uh, here in the northeast, it's kind of the flip of the situation. The habitat is primarily private and it's um, managed, uh, it's very dependent on spruce budworm outbreaks, but they're pretty confident that even with a downturn in the amount of habitat that there is in Maine for lynx that um, even at the, the lowest levels that they saw that Maine are that lynx are going to persist on that pot in that landscape in Maine. So really they've taken care of the regulatory issues that they had out west. The population is uh, doing very well in no the northeast. It's projected to kind of stabilize, maybe decline a little bit based on habitat, but uh, there's discussions that are being uh, undertaken to kind of ensure that habitat persists over time. And the Western states have, again, kind of addressed those regulatory issues. So I, I think it makes sense. I think it's, it's a good step. Do Where do they go in the summertime? Uh, they still reside in the same areas. Um, so they, we do find that, um, Alex A showed over the six year period, that's kind of the cool thing about his study that it was more than you know, your typical two year study that in years that we had low snow conditions and bobcats kind of moved more into where they were found, 
that it might push links out of some of those areas, but they're persisting in places year round um, where they, they should be. So um, they kind of stay within their home range for sure year round. How much does snowmobile trail compaction allow for competitors to get in and compete with links? Yeah, another great question. So uh, in the Martin work, we found that that was really critical um, to Martin because they are kind of segregated or they get pushed up into that high elevation habitat in the wintertime to decrease that competition between species. So it really comes down to teasing out how much that competition is important um, to determining where links are and where they're not. So um, I imagine compaction issues can play a role in um, where links kind of persist, um, but it's not, not as much as with a Martin, I would say, because uh, they're able to deal with the, the conditions differently. This is kind of a geeky question, but when you talk about modeling, is this regression modeling or how is, how is this being put together? And I'm kind of curious how you deal with the elevation in yeah. that situation. So Alex A really is the, uh, the guru when it comes to this. Um, I, I only begin to understand the modeling that's behind some of this work. So um, occupancy modeling is a type of regression. Mm -hmm. um, and so the occupancy models uh, that he's using is um, this new structured equation modeling. So it takes the occupancy model and it adds in the indirect effect piece. So it's almost another layer um, within that modeling structure. So I don't know if that's a regression as well or exactly what type of um, statistics are behind the structured equation part of it. But yeah, it's definitely regression uh, regressions that are being used in the occup occupancy modeling. And, and then elevation is put in as a separate factor, or is it just sort of part of these things like forest biomass and such? Yep. So uh, he looked at elevation as a factor, and it's highly correlated to uh -huh. not only the cover types that he was looking at, but also um, uh, it was too correlated. There was there was too much overlap, so it yeah. was excluded as as one of the variables. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Are there any final questions for Jill? Awesome presentation. Thank you. All right. Yes, I would echo that. Jill, thank you so much for a great program. Um, thank you for it. And I would say that for your inaugural virtual program, it was a smash <laughs> success. Um, you, you now, you get to take the crown for our highest viewed um, virtual program. So, oh, awesome. Excellent. I would take that, yes, as a compliment of, you know, and I think people are, you know, certainly very interested. In, in the work that you are doing. So thank you so much um, for presenting once again. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. And thanks everybody for participating. I see some definite familiar names out there.